I'll actually start with verse 13 just for the context. It says, The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. Talking about the Old Testament, the blood of the sacrifice could outwardly cleanse you, outwardly remove uh, defilement. But verse 14, how much more then will the blood of Christ Jesus, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? How much more will the blood of Jesus that's been offered by the power of the eternal spirit himself, he offered himself his own blood, unblemished to God, how much more will it cleanse our conscience, our inner man, our conscience, from acts that lead to death? So that we can do what? So that we can serve the living God. Amen. To cleanse our consciences Amen. so that we can serve the living God. The power of the blood of Jesus is greater than the power of the blood of bulls and goats and rams. The new covenant is sealed in the blood of Jesus it is the blood of the new covenant. And the blood of Jesus can cleanse our conscience. What I want to look at today is I want to teach on conscience. I want to teach on what is conscience, how important it is to us, and that it's only the blood of Jesus that can truly cleanse our conscience mm -hmm. yes. from guilt and shame and defilement. Last week we were looking at the subject of defilement and different things that can happen to defile us. And at the end of the message we, we confessed our sins and we confessed the things that have defiled us in life. And we washed ourselves with the blood of Jesus. And so I want to talk about the power of the blood of Jesus. Now we're also again in, in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 19 to 23. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 23. It says, Therefore, my brothers, uh, since we have confidence to enter into the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, the reason that we could enter into the most holy place through praise and worship this morning, some of you entered in. Some of you felt the presence of God. The reason that we can enter into the most holy place the reason that we can come into a, a son relationship with Father God is because of the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. And we have a confidence that we can enter into the very throne room of God and stand before the very throne of God because we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We don't have to have fear and guilt and shame as we stand there. This is the power of the good news uh, that we can stand with confidence in our prayer. We can stand in confidence in our worship. We, can, we don't have to be Christians that day by day struggle with guilt and shame. Uh, when you struggle day by day with guilt and shame uh, and, and, and a fear of God in a negative sense and a fear of judgment, it shows that you have not had faith in the blood of Jesus. It shows that you don't know the power of the cross. It shows, that, it shows that you are still just focusing on your sin and you're not focusing on the finished work of Jesus Christ. But we have a great confidence, even a great boldness, that we can enter into the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. It says we enter in by a new and a living way that has been opened for us through the curtain that is His body. We're going to take communion after the service again. And, and as you know, the, the grape juice or the wine... It represents the blood of Jesus. Um, the grape juice won't do anything for you, by the way. But when you have faith in the power of the blood of Jesus and you take communion, then the power of the blood is activated by your faith. So when you take communion, commune with the Lord and really receive the power of the blood. But it says here, very interestingly, there was like a closed curtain between man and God. There was like the gates of heaven were closed. We couldn't enter into the very presence of God. We couldn't enter into the most holy place. We were hindered because of our sin. And because of that sin, the gates of heaven closed. 
However, now the gates of heaven have been opened and we're told now it's a new and it's a living way. It's been opened for us through the curtain, which is his body. Jesus' body was the curtain. And we couldn't enter in the very heavens, the third heaven, because of our sin and Jesus was a closed door. However, on the cross, Jesus opened himself up. When his body was broken, the curtain was torn in the temple, but not just in the natural temple. In the natural temple, the curtain was torn. But the thing is, the interesting thing is they say that it was torn from the top down. Because you know why? God tore it. Not man. And see, Jesus on the cross, he was the curtain. And once his body was broken, now the way is made open for us to enter into the third heaven. Now, through worship. He is the new and the living way. Our covenant is greater than the old covenant. It says, since we have such a great high priest over the house of God, Jesus Christ, he is the high priest that offered the most perfect sacrifice himself. Not the blood of rams and goats. Jesus, the great high priest, offered his own blood. And because he he made the, the ultimate sacrifice for us. And because we have such a great high priest over the house of God, Let us now draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us now hold unswervingly onto the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. This is the Christian life. We shouldn't live under the power of guilt and shame. Guilt and shame is the natural consequence of sinning. Mm. It's good that guilt and shame be there, by the way. If you sin and you don't feel guilt and shame, I'm worried about you. Mm. But after you confess your sin, He's faithful and just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So guilt and shame, even fear, is an initial reaction emotionally. But when you continue to dwell in under guilt and shame, it shows that you haven't confessed your sin and you haven't been cleansed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm. And you might have prayed a prayer, saying, God, I'm sorry. But as long as the guilt and shame is there, it means that you haven't fully confessed. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> we need to apply the power of the blood. Maybe we need to get greater faith in the power of the blood. Maybe it's a sin of unbelief. I pray that God gives us revelation this morning. So it says this, we have such a great high priest, so let us draw near to God with sincere hearts. Um, my, my desire for you is that you would learn that worship that we start with is not what you do as a warm-up to the message. The prayer time that we have before church is not something we do for the, the early people while we're waiting for the late people to turn up. No, no. Prayer and worship is main event. That's, right, yeah. That's how we love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind and strength. That's, right, yeah. That's a relational thing. But then we need to learn how to, to draw near to God through praise and worship with sincere hearts, cleansed hearts, with the full assurance of faith that we know that He loves us, we know that He wants us in His presence. He's not there wanting to wipe us out and send us to hell. He does not take any delight that anyone would go to hell. He's willing that none would perish. That's the heart. We've got to know. He wants us with Him. He wants us to talk with Him. He loves us more than He hates our sin. And that's why God the Father loved the world so much He gave His only Son. And then the Son loved the world so much He died on the cross. And if God be for you, who can be against you? It says in Romans. So we need to have our hearts sincere, We need to have full assurance and we need to cleanse ourselves with the blood of Jesus. We need to cleanse our consciences. Now we need to hold on to this hope we have and we need to profess. For he promised, he who promised his faith. Profess means you declare with your tongue. Mm -hmm. You need to speak it out. You need to declare with your tongue. You need to profess your faith and your hope in him. That's what worship is about. That's what praise is about as we start. 
So now we looked at Jesus, the great high priest. We looked at the power of the blood of Jesus that can cleanse our conscience. Now I want to look a little bit more at the subject of conscience. I want to study some of the words that the Apostle Paul himself spoke about this subject. But I'm going to start with some prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we need greater revelation by the power of the Holy Spirit to understand deeply, more deeply, the power of the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We need greater revelation to understand the ministry Amen. of Jesus Christ as our great high priest. Amen. We need this revelation to break the curse of guilt and shame. Amen. To break the curse of, of a spiritual heaviness that comes on so many in the church of self-condemnation. Right. Yes. Lord, self-condemnation is a lack of faith. Right. Self-condemnation is looking at self and not looking at the finished work of Jesus. Mm. And Lord Jesus, I just ask that you'd open our eyes, give us a revelation this morning, the eyes of our heart, the ears of our heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so let's look at the book of Acts. Chapter 23. The book of Acts, chapter 23. <clears throat> Starting with verse 1 to 5. It says, Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and he said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty before God in all good conscience. Up to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered that those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, How dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I didn't realize that he was the high priest. For it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. So the Apostle Paul is standing before the Sanhedrin. And with the Sanhedrin is the, the high priest um, of Israel at that time, uh, but he was no longer high priest because uh, Jesus had come and Jesus was sitting at the throne of heaven and Jesus serving in the true temple, the heavenly temple is the true high priest. Mm -hmm. That's what we just looked at in Hebrews. Jesus is serving in the... And so Paul has revelation that Jesus is the true high priest. This man now standing in, in the Sanhedrin... In Jerusalem, is not. He thinks he is. But he's just a man. Understand that background. So Lord, Paul looks straight at the Sanhedrin. He says, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty before God in all good conscience up to this day. Um, I don't have time to go through every scripture I have where the Apostle Paul makes statements about him doing everything he can to have a clear conscience or a good conscience before God as he serves God. There is many, many verses. In other words, the Apostle Paul, how he lived his life, and by the way, we need to imitate him. He said, imitate me. We need to imitate him. He's an example to us. We should live like Paul. And he understood. He stands before the true and the living God, he serves the true and the living God. He's called by the true and living God. Did you know you stand before the true and living God? You are called by the true and living God. You are called, all of you are called into a ministry. There is no question, are you called or aren't you called? It's just, what are you called to? Yeah, that's right, yeah. yes, oh, man. But we, like Paul, we all need to see that we are called by God, we stand before Him, and we must give account to Him for everything we do. So Paul understood, I am standing not so much before the Sanhedrin of men. I'm not standing before me. I'm standing before the true and living God. I must give account to him Amen. how I serve him. And he says, I strive to have a clear conscience before my God. 
He understood the importance of having a, a clear conscience, an undefiled conscience. Yeah, yeah. A conscience that's not defiled. When you've got guilt and shame constantly in your conscience, your conscience is defiled. Do you understand that? <coughs> you need to remove guilt and shame. So when you've got guilt and shame, there's a reason it's there. It could be the sin of unbelief. It could be the sin that, that you are not trusting in God the way you should. That's sin, by the way. So Paul said, whatever I do, I make sure I've got a clear conscience before God, I'm making myself accountable to first and foremost to God in how I live. And it goes on. Um, when the high priest Ananias hears this, uh, Ananias is obviously moving in another spirit, not the spirit of the Lord. He's moving in that dead religion, Pharisaic spirit. And dead religion will always manifest in anger and be offended at those people that have a, a good and pure conscience before God. And so Ananias is offended at this. He, he commands those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul, after he's being struck, this is what Paul says. He says, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Jesus spoke about the Pharisees and he said, You are like whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Mm -hmm. See, a whitewashed tomb full of dead men's bones is clean on the outside. That's right, yeah. Remember the old covenant, the old the, the, the goats and the bulls, their blood was only cleansing the outside. The Pharisees are always looking at the outside. What do I look like to men? What clothes am I wearing today? I want to look good. I want to look holy. I want to look like um, I'm pure before men. But on the inside, dead men's bones. There you go. It's a skeleton. There you go. Dead. In other words, there's death inside. In here. Outside you go to church. Outside you look good. You look spiritual. This is what... Paul is saying to this man, this high priest, he says, on the outside you look really awesome, you look like a great man of God, but I know what's on the inside of you. It's death. Mm. You see, this is the importance of cleansing our conscience and not just outwardly appearing righteous. Not just outwardly, because there's a lot of leaders in the church that outwardly appear righteous and they haven't cleansed themselves on the inside. Therefore, behind closed doors, all sorts of unrepented sin goes on. Mm. Domestic violence... Abuse of children, sexual immorality. That God sees the inside. Mm. It's time that we cleanse the church from the inside out. Amen. And we start by cleansing ourselves. Amen. But as long as you struggle with guilt and shame, it shows that you haven't cleansed yourself on the inside. Mm. There's something you've not dealt with properly. Mm. Now, the whitewashed wall is a very interesting picture because <clears throat> what would sometimes happen is when they were building walls, you know, walls are there for protection, to keep the robbers out or the thieves out, or you maybe keep the animals out of your fields. You build a wall as, as a place of protection. Um, but what they would sometimes do is they'd try to build the wall really quickly and they'd try to save money by not putting enough of the, um, the cement type, they didn't have cement back then, but anyway, the cement type stuff that they had, mud and different things, See, they just put the bricks together and they build a very shonky wall. Mm. Shonky means it's not a firm, strong wall. But what they do, they whitewash it. So when you come to look at the wall, it looks like, oh, wow, that's a really nice looking wall. Mm. I can remember in China, we used to say when I first went to China, these guys are really good at building walls because they used to build walls everywhere. You know? But the thing is, they put these walls together, all the bricks, and there was hardly any cement on them. And if you lean up against some of these walls, they'd just crumble and fall. Now really, it was pretty dangerous. And this is what Paul was saying. He's saying, on the outside, you look like a holy, righteous man. People honour and respect you as a high priest. But actually, on the inside, you know, if the wind blows hard enough, your life will crumble. Mm. If someone comes along and puts enough pressure on you, you're going to fall apart. Yeah. Mm. See, some of us Christians are whitewashed walls. Because... Maybe on the outside we go to church, we look good, 
in prayer meetings in front of other people. We might do the right thing. But see, the true person inside here has not been built up strong in the Lord. Mm. Which means when pressure of life comes on you, your whole life falls apart. Mm. When the enemy comes in with his temptation, you easily yield. Mm. Surrender to the enemy. When, when life is tough, you fall apart. You can't handle pressure. Mm. It's, see, because on the inside, that's who you really are. That's right. And so Paul was discerning. Number one, you aren't the real high priest. You're pretending. See, whitewashed wall was also a synonym for saying you're a hypocrite. Mm. You're a hypocrite. Which means you're wearing a mask, you're pretending to be somebody that you're not, and you wear the mask before men. But Paul is saying, I stand before God, and I make sure my conscience is right before God, because God sees who I really am, and I'm living before God, because I know I will stand there on judgment day, He will judge me according to who I really am. Mm. And even in this life, I will reap what I sow according to who I really am. That's right. So how do you live? Who are you behind closed doors when no one's looking? Hey? When you're home alone? Who are you when you're under pressure? Are you a whitewashed wall? Well, today we want to acknowledge that. Amen. Let's get rid of the whitewash. Let's acknowledge it, pull the wall apart, Amen. put in some good cement. <laughs> let's, let's rebuild Amen. our lives. Amen. And the way that we rebuild our lives is we're going to come back to genuine confession of sin and calling sin, sin. But then after you've repented, wash yourself clean and then get strong in the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So again, my point, as long as you keep struggling with depression and shame and guilt, it means that you've not been able to cleanse yourself properly. There's something wrong in your process. Okay.